this talk is, as the title says, about, about crowdsourcing. And um, when I received the invitation to, to give the talk, um, first I thought, oh my god, I have 45 minutes or 30 minutes to speak and there are so many things to talk about and I'm very passionate about this area as well, so I would never be able to cut it down to 30 minutes. Then I started doing some research um, to see how this community, how libraries, how um, research libraries in particular, um, do already apply crowdsourcing. And I found so many exciting and interesting projects. So then I had my second moment of panicking and I thought, oh, actually they know everything about the topic, so there isn't much I can tell them that they don't know about. Um, so this talk is basically the result of the struggle. And um, my hope is to convince you that crowdsourcing is not just a very hyped word, um, but it can actually help in uh, many of the content management tasks that you're dealing with on a, on a daily basis. However, crowdsourcing is also a very complex field. So in this talk, I'm trying to give you an overview of the different types of crowdsourcing, of all the approaches, the richness of the space, which you could take into account when you set up your own crowdsourcing project. I would also um, want to give you a feeling about the types of tasks you should use crowdsourcing for and the ones in which you should rather maybe invest in technology or train your in-house experts to carry them out. Because as much as it is a solution to almost everything online, crowdsourcing might not be the best solution for your particular problem, especially if we take into account um, very mundane things people might not want to talk about, like time and accuracy and, and budgets and so on and so forth. And then in the end, towards the end of the talk, I want to introduce you to this vision that we have in one of our research projects at the University of Southampton, um, which is related to what we call social machines, which are online large-scale assemblies of human and computational intelligence, which come together in some sort of a utopic scenario to um, make sure that we solve all our problems in our daily and private life and that um, we advance economy and society. So that's basically the executive summary. Um, let me get back to um, crowdsourcing as it is. How many of you did hear about this term before? So, yeah, as I was suspecting, basically everyone. So in a nutshell, um, the topic has been around for, for more than eight years now. Um, but it stands for a general framework by which you have a problem and you solve it via an open call. And when I say open call, I mean you don't use typical outsourcing mechanisms in which you approach um, another organization to carry out a task and execute a project, but you um, use an open call to a large network of potential contributors. And you can take this concept and apply it from the, from the enterprise setting in which it was originally defined to online worlds, to social networks, to um, public sector information, to consultancy, marketing, and so on and so forth. But the basic thing to, to remember about it is that the call for contributions, the type of people that will help you to run your project, um, are previously unknown. You want to have lots of them, or as many of them as you need, to carry out the project, um, but you don't know them in advance. And since you don't know them in advance, you have to, there are different ways in which you could interact with them or influence their behavior as compared to when you have an enterprise, when you have a group of students in a university and you uh, let them execute the same project. There is a different type of social or organizational structure. There are different types of things you know about their performance. There are other means you have to set up in order to encourage them to behave in a certain way. There are many and many forms of crowdsourcing. 
So on the, this umbrella on the um, left hand side is a rough attempt to classify some of the approaches you might have heard of in the literature. Um, so the red and the green bits distinguish between the granularity of the tasks. You have something called macro task, which stands for any type of project um, which you just give out, publish, um, without giving specific instructions about how the actual project will be executed. The classical example is you want to design a logo for, for your website. You want to outsource the design of your website itself. Um, you want to find a name for a new product. So you're looking for creative ideas from people you don't know of in advance and you're asking the crowd to uh, come up with solutions. Um, the other type of crowdsourcing, if we talk about it in these terms, is what we call micro tasks. And as the name says, this stands for those types of tasks that are very small, atomic. Um, an example is, for instance, tagging. You want people to tag the, the papers um, that you have in your repositories so that you can take advantage of all the beautiful search features you have heard about in the previous talk. Um, a micro task in that, in that particular example would be the task of tagging this particular paper and then you can specify it further. So we're talking about finer granular tasks and the point there is you would want to have many people engaging with these tasks in the same time in parallel. So there, the, f the reason why people um, do that is because this type of work can be broken down into many, many smaller bits that can be executed independently. And if things work the way, um, the way um, people tell you in, um, in the literature, then you would end up tagging hundreds of thousands of papers in something like days, which is something for various reasons you wouldn't be able to do in your organizations, because you have other things to do, because it's too expensive to do, and so on and so forth. The other uh, parts of the umbrella, there are contests and, and crowdfunding. I will leave crowdfunding aside. Contests are complementary to micro and macro tasks because they just speak for a form of engaging with the crowd, which assumes a certain type of reward. So there, basically, you will reward only the top three or something uh, of the contributors, and everyone else will go home and will be happy that they participated. Um, contests can be, so this contest model can be combined with, both with microtasks and macrotasks, and as I will explain you later on, um, there are other reward models you could, uh, you could, uh, you could apply as well. So already from, from this picture, um, I hope you understand that when you talk about crowdsourcing, let's crowdsource a project, you already have a series of specific methods and approaches you could rely on based on the task, on the type of project that you have, and on the, the rewards uh, that you are willing uh, to give out. Um, so what are the challenges and opportunities for research libraries from my point of view? And I have uh, gone out there um, and tried to see what type of projects uh, could, be, could be useful and interesting uh, for this audience. Um, and I have started with something um, which maybe some of you know, which is an older project called Distributed Proofreaders, in which the idea was to um, improve the results of OCR processes. Um, so you have digitized text, and then you, you, um, there are mistakes, errors that can, that can happen in the automatic process, and then you ask experts or, or, or volunteers to help correct those mistakes. Um, a similar type of project is um, a project in the Zooniverse citizen science platform. I don't know how many of you have heard about it. So the Zooniverse is a, a platform for what we call citizen science or crowdsourced science. 
uh, that runs at the University of Oxford. They have 20 or so projects in various scientific disciplines. Um, one of them is called Operation War Diary. So similar to, like, to distributed proofreaders, they have um, digitized context pictures of, of old war diaries that they would want to be organized and tagged and enriched in a particular fashion. Um, what else is out there? So something, something I found very interesting is called Metadata Games. Um, this is a slightly different approach to uh, the usual, I put the content out there, this is a task that will advance the humanity, come volunteers and help me do it. Um, this is an approach which actually exploits our human inclination to spend 20 minutes of our day playing silly games. Um, and what, what it does is they, so it, the, the approach is called games with a purpose, whereas the purpose is understood from the point of view of the designer of the game. Um, and there, you, you can imagine, you can understand them like quizzes, casual games, very simple games, played at a very fa uh, fast pace, where you are asked to answer questions like, I don't know, what is the capital of Latvia? Um, is it this city or this city? When was it founded? And so on and so forth. So uh, you play this game, but actually the replies, the, the answers that you provide are used as metadata for some digital artifact in the, in the back end. And this metadata games is an initiative to develop technology to create such games easily. And it's been used by a number of, um, of, uh, of libraries, for instance, to build image tagging games. So in terms of opportunities, um, by engaging with the crowd, be that volunteers or paid contributors or uh, participants in a contest, you have an affordable and most of the times quite accurate way to enhance your information management services. This means you could outsource tasks such as um, image annotation, labeling, or um, even search to some extent if you do, if you apply social search features. Um, you could also capitalize on a scholarly practice that is getting more and more important in uh, different disciplines, which is citizen science, which outsources, applies crowdsourcing ideas to engage with citizens as part of established scientific workflows. You could also, but I will not talk about this in this talk, have a better customer experience. So visitors of online websites expect certain things from any website like uh, in the previous talk. So if Google does it, then of course your search feature will also have to support you to some extent because they're used for, if Amazon allows you to interact and give reviews and so on and so forth, uh, this is something that you will, uh, you will need to do as well. So crowdsourcing is one way to uh, engage with your customers and give them the feeling that they are part of the process, they can, their, their wishes and thoughts and needs are, are listened to. The challenges, however, are to understand what would actually drive participation, especially in, in, in cases in which you want volunteers, people to volunteer their time to do it. Um, many projects in crowdsourcing um, apply similar principles to the ones that I will introduce, uh, but do not reach critical mass. Um, and one of the things I will go into in more detail is, what this critical mass actually is. So you have this, this power law distribution that you also see in Wikipedia, that 10% of the actual, of the customers, of the visitors of the website are the ones who contribute 90% of the time. This is not something that uh, should be discouraging. This is something you should be aware of and you should think about what kind of contributions you could realistically expect from the long tail, from the 90% who visit the website maybe once and edit and, and, I don't know, correct one spelling mistake in a Wikipedia article, and the 10% who actually put lots of effort into editing the articles. These types of contributors are likely to be driven by other types of rewards and motivation. Um, and it will, one of the main challenges when you set up a crowdsourcing project would be to understand that. 
In this talk, I will understand crowdsourcing as what is called human computation. Human computation means that we resort to human intelligence, to, con to, to human contributions, to enhance the results of automatic algorithms. If I go back to, um, well, let's say extracting keywords from a research publication. This is something, this is a task that could be executed totally manually. You give someone the paper and you say, okay, why don't you just tell me which keywords you think are important? And then probably you ask more than one person and, and aggregate the results and select the top five keywords that you want. That's one way to do it. Alternatively, you could say, I apply some sort of machinery, an information extraction algorithm, who will tell me, oh, I think these are the top 20 topics I would extract from, from this document, using models like the TF-IDF one that was mentioned earlier. And then you ask, you apply human intelligence just to enhance the results. Uh, of that algorithm. And this is the classical human computation scenario. This is opposed to something like uh, creative processes, um, where, for instance, an organization would reach out to their customers um, to come up with a new combination for the McDonald's burger. This is actually done, and it's one of the, one of the most successful examples. So they reach out people and say create your own burger then they have some sort of voting mechanism and then whoever wins has their burger in some area, at least in Germany it was done um, and, and it's actually sold in, in, in shops, so I will not talk about this um, I will also now from, uh, from, from this point on I will introduce you to the main dimensions of a crowdsourcing project uh, so the types of things you have to think about um, when, you, when, when you set it up. And I will use one example, um, which is the crowdsourced collection of data citation information. So this was an experiment we ran um, completely by, by coincidence two months ago at a semantic web conference. And it, the task was to collect, we wanted to know, so we are obsessed with publishing linked data. We have many of our data sets published as linked data, and we want to know who else is using these data sets in, in their research papers. So we wanted to collect information uh, about these data sets, about the versions uh, of the data sets that are useful. Um, for instance, I don't know if you have heard about DBpedia, which is a more a fancier version of, of the Wikipedia info boxes, basically. Um, so if you search for DBpedia papers, Google Scholar will give you something, 9,000 something publications. There are also 40 or so versions of Wikipedia already available. Um, so we would want to know as a community, in order to understand the research, to reproduce the results and so on, which version of DBpedia is used in each paper. So we set up this website which you can find at that URL, just to see what type of crowdsourcing methods and mechanism we could apply in order to get this information. And this is the example I will, I will use um, in, the, in the following. So, you want to set up a human computation project? What are the things you should think about? Well, first of all, you have to consider what types of tasks what type of work you want to outsource in the first place. Because in theory, you could, every task could be amenable to crowdsourcing, but some tasks are more, well, benefit more from it than others. And these are typically those tasks which do not require lots of expertise, but rely on human skills that ev all of us have. So visual recognition of objects, language understanding, communication, and so on. Then you also have to think about who do you actually reach out to? Is it everyone? Um, is it a casual visitor of your website? In theory, this is not everyone. So based on whom you're going to disseminate, you're gonna promote this project to, you will not reach everyone. So you'll have a bias actually in the types of people that will go back to the, to, to the website and, and engage maybe with the project. Um, 
how are you actually going to outsource the task? So there are a number of, of, of things that they need to be taken into account here. So I mentioned these micro tasks. And in this scenario, which is typical for human computation, you break down the actual work into smaller units and you have people working on them in parallel. So you have, so I mentioned Zooniverse. One of their projects classifies millions of images of galaxies that have been uh, collected by the Oxford Observatory. And they want to know what type of galaxies are there. So they ask people, look at this image. You see some sort of white sphere in the middle of the image. What is this? Is it, it, does it look more like a star? Does it look more like a plate? Does it look more like a UFO? Um, so they capitalize on our basic object recognition skills, collect that information. Well, that's not science in itself, but it helps them train some image recognition, image analysis algorithms that then lead to scientific uh, discoveries in astrophysics. Um, this type of task can be broken down into smaller units because you have one million images and every user of their system can classify how many images, whatever number of images they want. When you have something more complex than that, you will need to coordinate between the individual, between the individual uh, contributors. And this will require more effort from your side, um, and it will also slow down the process. What kind of complex workflows do I mean here? Well, it doesn't have to be complex in the sense of something that cannot be written down as an algorithm. It is as, take for example, the task of translation from one language to another. Um, you could, you have a paper and you want to have, you have it in English, you want to have a German version, what would you do? Would you give the paper to one person and say translate it? Would you give it to the crowd and say everyone, why don't you translate this paper and then I'm going to collect uh, the results and see how I merge them and what do I do with them? What if the document is 500 pages long? Then you actually want to break this down and to give people, I don't know, maybe one page to translate. Then, again, you'll have to think about do they have the right context to make the, the right translation. You might also want to go for, for a setting in which you would ask someone to do the translation, but you will not do the correction and the editing. You will ask yet the crowd again in a second step of the workflow to go through the translations and, and pick the best one. So this is an example of what they call complex workflow in crowdsourcing, which is everything that cannot be you know, bluntly broken down into smaller units like the million of images of galaxy example that I brought up earlier. Right. So, um, I think I, I, I mentioned this already. So Zooniverse has something like 27 projects at the moment, some of which probably also interesting for, 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 for the, uh, this audience, most of them um, in, in, in astrophysics. And they have a million users. So one million people go to their site and spend hours and hours of their, um, of their uh, day classifying galaxies, labeling um, specific objects in, in videos, uh, transcribing war diaries, transcribing weather logs, and so on and so forth. Now, let's get back to, to the example I had before. So, so remember what, what the task was? The task was, these are the papers, these are the data sets, candidate data sets, let's establish the links, which paper uses which data set. Um, that's one way to define the task, but it's not the only way. You always have to think, is this the most appropriate representation of the domain? What, I'm what am I going to show to the user? And is this enough? Or isn't this, is, is it maybe overwhelming? So in our experiment, we had just the bibliographic item, the title, the author, and the, the publication venue, and some information about the data set. This might be enough for someone who is an expert, who comes from that area. 
For someone else, you might want to show them an abstract. You might want to show them the first page. Um, you might want to show them the full paper. What if the full paper is not available? What if it's very long and uh, then the, the, the whole process is, is slowed down? So you have, one of the things you have to, to be careful about is how are you going to represent and specify the task to the, to the contributors? What happens if we don't know the list of potential answers? So in our example, it was quite clear because we were thinking about one particular data set. What if you don't know these data sets? What if you ask them, what data sets do these people? What, look at this paper and tell me the data sets that are used. You will have no means whatsoever to know whether the results are correct or not. You may want to merge them. You'll have to deal with different spellings. You'll have to deal with different ways of, of uh, writing down versioning numbers and so on and so forth. Who would be the crowd in this case? Well, the people who know the papers and the data sets, or even the authors of the papers, they require almost no context information whatsoever. You can also think about anyone else. Um, in the field, anyone knowledgeable of English, for instance, anyone with a computer, anyone with a cell phone. Again, if you want people to, to um, execute the task on their cell phone, you'll have to think of various of other representations of the task. You don't show them the full abstract on the mobile phone. Yeah? So th you'll have to pick to think about what crowd would be the most appropriate what task am I actually trying to solve? And pick the ones that are right for you. And no one says you should just go for one option. How is going to ta in, in this experiment, so what types of task models can we imagine? One option would be let some algorithm identify the data set names and then offer these candidates to the, to the volunteers to select. You could also use something like paid microtasks. Have you heard of Mechanical Turk? Mecha yeah? Um, so these are platforms where you pay people four to five cents a dollar to solve tasks like that. You could use them to do a first screening and then you could have experts or even the authors of the papers to sort out the challenging cases. You could organize a competition via Twitter. You could have, I don't know, the question of the day. Which, uh, which version of this data set does this paper use? You can involve the author saying, oh, we found out that this and this and this data sets are used in your paper. Is this correct, yes or no? Let's move forward. Um, two more dimensions of crowdsourcing. So we had the task, the crowd, and the way you actually design the workflow. You will need a way to validate the results. Because whatever will come in from the, from the volunteers might not be, is, is not per default accurate for various reasons. Maybe you didn't specify the task well enough. They didn't understand it. You have lots of spam on some of these platforms. People who just go there, uh, especially in the paid cases, and just sit in front of, you have farms, microtask farms, companies who sit in some parts of this world and employ people just to click on some of these, solve somehow some of these tasks on these platforms. So it is a big problem. And it is up to you to actually collect the results from the crowd and decide which ones are, are correct or not. Of course, some cases are easier than others. And, those ca and, and, and I mean by that those cases in which the set of potentially correct answers is known. So if I know all 292 open data sets published as linked data, that's all there is to it for me. And I will look for different spellings of those data sets and that's it. If the answers are open, if you have free text as contributions, then of course you'll have to think of other, of other things. And then there are various ways to optimize the process, in particular the way you devise, you engineer your incentives. Um, in our case, the validation was 
quite straightforward. It's, it's, it's quite straightforward, as I was saying, as the set of potential answers is, uh, is, is fixed. What you want to do there as well is to have more than one person giving the answer to the same task because you want to have redundancy and because you want to apply something like some sort of majority voting to identify those answers that are, um, that are likely to be correct. Now, something that is less straightforward is related to incentives. And, of course, everyone would want to have volunteers engaging with the site, executing the task, giving ideas for new services. Um, but the problem with volunteering is that it's highly context specific. There is one successful Wikipedia and there were 200 other projects at the same, at the same time, similar scope, similar technology, they failed. And we actually don't know why. It's not applicable to arbitrary tasks as well. So people are very fond about galaxies, but maybe not so fond about research papers and data sets. So this is why you actually go to things like contests or Mechanical Turk. Um, just a word about this. So if you decide to pay your contributors, it is, in general, it is affordable um, because you pay something like four to five cents for each correct answer. However, if you, have, if you want to do this as part of your internal processes, you'll have to think about optimizations because you don't want to spend so for the 9,000 papers I mentioned earlier, we would have to spend something like 5,000 US dollars with all the redundancy embedded with all the, uh, the, the validation afterwards. Well, for $5,000, you actually hire someone and who has knowledge in the field and, and, and uh, you, know, you can expect other types of other level of accuracy from them. Analytics can help. Uh, I don't have much time to, to, to go into details for that, but this is some work we've been doing for, for citizen scientists from Zooniverse where we give them basically a dashboard of what their users are doing. So they can see when users leave or predict when users leave. Um, to think about the performance or, or study the performance of the individual contributors and then decide how to act accordingly. Um, in the experiment that I mentioned earlier, the important thing to think about is who will benefit from the results and who will own them. So assuming I will actually create all these links between data sets and, and, and papers, is it something for the public good? Um, is it something that me as a researcher just crowdsource to the community and then uh, the results will be free? Um, wouldn't it be a better model maybe to work together with a publisher who has maybe all the papers, who has already a community, who has a website in place uh, that is highly visible. But then the question will be, will people come back to the site and engage with the experiment if uh, the ownership of the result is with the designer? And so on and so forth. You could use different crowds for different tasks as well. I mentioned this a bit earlier as well. This is a, some work we have done for the International Semantic Web Conference in which we have successfully combined experts in a contest and then paid micro turkers to curate DBpedia. But what you want to have in the end, as I was saying at the beginning, is to use humans, humans are a very valuable result, uh, resource and they can be quite unreliable as well. You cannot really predict how they will behave. What you want to have is to use them only for those cases which are really engaging and interesting for them, but are also beneficial for, for your project. So what you want to have is to have the symbiotical relationship system that uses computers and humans to solve specific tasks. And this is, this is already very, very, very technical, but just to give you an idea of what, for instance, the database people are doing. They are extending SQL, and so their query engines, with crowd operators. So for particular things, like when you want to merge those two tables over there, they will use, half of it will be classical SQL query uh, execution, but in five of the cases, they will ask the crowd. And I would like to conclude um, the, the talk by 
revisiting what I said earlier. So I hope I gave you an overview of, or at least the feeling of the diversity of this field and the types of questions that you want to consider when you set up a crowdsourcing project. I haven't had time to talk about sustaining engagement and this is, this is more an art than a science and I'm, uh, I'm a scientist and not a marketeer. Um, but I would want to reinforce the last point that I made, that computers are still very good at many things. They might be imperfect at others, but the ultimate aim should not be to have crowdsourcing applied over and over again for the same type of tasks. The aim should be to collect to use, to capitalize on these contributions to improve information technology, which is what we call in, in, in the Socium project the age of social machines. Social machines is a term that has been introduced by Tim Berners-Lee um, early on, in which he lays out this, this, this vision in which you have social machines enabled by the web, in which people do the creative work and the machine does the administration. Thank you very much for the invitation again, and if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Thank you. Do you have any questions for Elena? Thanks a lot for your talk, uh, Irina Kuchma Eiffel. Uh, I have a question. What, what do you think about the term uh, crowdsourcing? Because uh, there was a comment some time ago from Francois Gray that uh, it has this allusion to cheap labor, menial tasks, so maybe it's better to call it crowdcrafting because then it would be real innovations by volunteers. Thanks. Um. Personally, I, I look at it from a, from a systems engineer perspective. So I don't care so much how it is called as I care about the principle. And the original principle um, did not involve necessarily these aspects. Um, I think this comment, which is, which is valid, um, refers to platforms, microtask platforms like Mechanical Turk. Um, but even then, um, you have to imagine, so when Amazon introduced this in 2004, this was quite a revolutionary concept because it brought the computing back to the humans. I mean, the first, the first computers were humans. They were actually females and they were hairdressers. Yeah? The first computers were human computers were during the French Revolution were used to build logarithmic tables. Um, so there was a very simple process. Apparently hairdressers in that time, in those turbulent ta times, didn't have much to do. So they were all, they all came together and were paid to, to do these very simple computations. This was the first, the first example back then. And now Amazon in 2004, hundreds of years later, she introduced it again on the web. No one actually knew what this is going to turn into. And then you have seen this development. Some, an economist says, say, um, or at least the discussions I had, th this development wasn't quite unexpected. It was a particular type of labor market that they're very fond studying in which you see developments such as you know, supply and demand. You have a, a very adaptive way of defining the prices. The prices per tasks on Mechanical Turk, Turk are now on an average of five cents per task from one cent five years back. You have the, tur the workers as well organize themselves. You have a union, for instance, of, of Turkas. Mechanical Turk, so the platform provider, is now much more careful in terms of ethical considerations, le legal and taxation issues, and so on and so forth. So in, in short, yes, there are the, some of these cases, 
But from my personal point of view, it's still a very a rapidly changing field in which we will see some, some directions, which are typical to, to, to labor markets, that will uh, try to deal with the situation. Any other questions? Could I ask you a question? How many of you have a crowd, uh, crowdsourcing project? Could you please raise hand? Well, about ten percent. Yeah. And how many of you like like to start a crowdfunding project? Crowdfund? Oh, yeah, crowdfunding is yeah. A crowdsourced project. project. Nobody. Oh well, no. Some 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 people do. Some people do. Yeah. Well, I hope that you can take some of the some of these insights to into account when you set it up. We have another question there. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Adam Sofronievich, University Library of Belgrade. Um, uh, you mentioned that cre creativity is an important part in um, distinguishing between machine uh, work and human work. And can you elaborate further on uh, how we define creativity um, nowadays and in the future? Because uh, we have machines driving cars, uh, winning Jeopardy contests, everything that five, five or six years ago was considered to be a creative job. Um, and if you could elaborate further on which jobs would be creative in an academic library in this sense. <laughs> right. Thank you. Okay, well, that's, 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 that's a tough question. Let me just start by, 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 by telling you what I think creativity needs. But then again, uh, yes, sorry. I usually walk a lot during the presentation, so I was stuck here. Um, right, creativity. For me, and from a, from a crowdsourcing design point of view, creative is everything that you, cannot, that you don't know how to do. So you actually don't have a cookbook saying, first you do this, then you do this, then you do this, then you do this. And you pretty much can, can um, estimate the range of outcomes for each step. So this would be, creative is, is something that you cannot pin down and write down as some sort of algorithm that can be engineered. But that's my very limited view of the world and, and, and the point of view I take in this talk. Uh, now the second part of the question was creative jobs in the, um, in, the in academic libraries, right? Um, well, I think there will be still lots of of, of creativity and, 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 and room for, for humans to contribute when it comes to the design of new services. I don't think data processing, data processing should be outsourced to, to, to machines for most of the times. It is not done today because the, our algorithms are just, or our tools are just so frustrating that in the end you just decide to do everything in Excel. Um, but um, this shouldn't be the case and the hope is that through crowdsourcing projects we will manage to solve at least some of, the, some, some of these projects uh, and some of these challenges. But the, crea the creative bit will still remain in how, what type of services do I offer to the visitors? Um, how do I design them? How do I interact with them? Um, it will also, human communication is something that, that is very difficult to be, to, be, to be replaced as well. So I think in, in, in that, in that um, uh, regard, we shouldn't be so worried. Yeah. We actually should be very hopeful that we will have the time to uh, think about new and, and exciting services and things we could do as opposed to doing content management. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you, very you again. Much for, the, for this, well, the mechanism of the Thank you. So, now we have a second round of poster presentations. Could I invite, please, the presenters of posters to form a lineup? Uh, because we're going to have uh, lots of posters in only 10 minutes. Um, and while we're forming the lineup, may I uh, invite you, uh, because after these 15 minutes we have a coffee break, um, you can avoid the queue if you go to the reception desk and cast your vote for the best poster you've seen. And you're always free to go downstairs and have a look at them again. Um,
So please do cast your votes. Um, and now we'll be ready for our posters. The mechanism is very simple. One minute a poster. So I would like to first speaker, please. Hello, everyone. My name is Tanya Stoyanova from New Bulgaria University in Sofia. You can see our iceberg. Actually, this is a Bulgaria, but it's a metaphor because Bulgaria is a very warm country. And our repository was launched in 2005 and is the first repository launched in Bulgaria. It has two unique features. Depositing is voluntary and entirely made by authors. And the second one, uh, the original content is deposited on its uh, unique language. Uh, our team performs a monitoring of the metadata that is uploaded into the repository all the time so that to improve the depositing and self-archiving literacy and trainings also. A six-month uh, survey has been conducted to find out what are most common mistakes made by authors during the depositing. And if you want to see the results and to learn more about our open access policy, you are welcome to visit us at the poster area. Thank you very much and congratulations for the conference in the city of Riga. Thank you. Good afternoon, colleagues. My name is Thomas Baldwin. I'm from the M25 Consortium of Academic Libraries. We're a consortium of higher education and research libraries in the southeast of the United Kingdom. We recently ran a JISC-funded project to examine the consortial purchase of e-books. That project was EBAS 25. We identified four possible patron-driven acquisition business models within the project. Purchase, rental, usage, and evidence-based. The evidence-based PDA model was selected as being the most desirable for our consortium because it combines user choice with the possibility for alignment with libraries' collection development policies. The poster briefly notes pros and cons of three of the models and then gives more detailed implications of the chosen evidence-based model as M25 transforms this project into a service. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. The Slovak Center of Scientific and Technical Information is a national information center and specialized scientific library with key position in information support to science and research in Slovakia. We are project solver of several national projects co-financed from EU resources. They are also known as so-called structural funds. Our first and main project is the name is uh, the National Information System to Promote Research and Development in Slovakia with subtitle Access to Electronic Information Resources, <coughs> known to academic sphere and in all country under the acronym NISPES. Project has four specific goals. Our posters introduce three of them. First, is centralized provision of access to electronic information resources. Second, national search portal for science and research. And third one, central data bank of Slovak information resources for research and development. Please welcome us. We are ready to answer your questions. Thank you. Hello, uh, 
my name is Dati Rosenberger and I work at the Royal Holloway University of London. As you may know, in the UK we have a strong focus on open access, largely driven forward by the open access policies from different funding bodies. And our poster looks at uh, how one such policy, Research Council's UK policy on open access, has been implemented at Royal Holloway, what internal processes we have in place to support academics to meet the requirements, uh, what advocacy we do, and uh, how we distribute and monitor the funding for article processing charges. If you would like to know more or would like to share your experiences, please come and talk to me. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Mireia Pérez Cervera and I come from the Open University of Catalonia in Barcelona. In the UOC virtual library, we have our website as a unique point of interaction with our users. In this poster, we try to present how we've uh, passed from an old-fashioned website, unusable and not intuitive, to a new library site organized using a user-centered design method. To do so, we've conducted benchmarking, benchmarking analysis, interviews, focus groups, and user tests. Then, we've been able to identify problems and develop new actions, like including better explanations of processes and services, organizing the, the access to the content in terms of user needs rather, in, of, in terms, rather than in terms of library tools, uh, introducing one simple point of access to resources, and structuring the content and information to each profile so that each of them could now know the specific conditions of their profile. Um, come to visit poster number 16. I will, I, will, I will be downstairs on the coffee break. Thank you. Hello. My name is Yolanda Ivanova. I'm from Riga Technical University Scientific Library. The poster theme is creation of common territorial complex for Riga Technical University. The Riga Technical University Scientific Library, which is still a combination of the past and the present, must be viewed with a new perspective and understanding if it is to fulfill its potential in adding value to the advancement of the university academic mission and in moving with the university into the future. The poster's main goal is to reflect the new and combined services along with their added values in the United RTU Scientific Library Complex. So, if you have any questions, find me during this conference and we will discuss about it. Thank you. Hello, my name is Dunja Ligat. I'm coming from the University of Maribor Library. Our library this year decided to support the strategic goal of our university. This is to increase the usage of e-learning environment at our university. Approximately 50% of the students, this is 9,000 students, are users, actively users of e-learning environment Moodle. So we have to decide to meet their needs for library services also inside of the e-learning environment. Uh, we started with a pilot this year. We, did, we finished a uh, showcase with one subject at the med medical faculty. So we do this, have done this in two levels, first level and the entry page of the Moodle with external links as offer for the students. And the second level is the My Courses page where we use the functionalities of EBSCO Discovery Service and Clip Guides to create a recommend lists that these do the professors and to establish tighter connection between uh, students and our subject librarians. So thank you very much for your attention. I'll be downstairs number 18. Thank you. Uh, hello, my name is Tatiana Timotievic from the National Library of Serbia. Uh, the title of our poster is uh, How We Made It Easy is More Visible. Uh, well, in Serbia we have um, a lot of institutional repositories, uh, but the last year we implemented a national uh, repository of ETSIS, uh, which is called DOI Serbia PhD. 
uh, why we uh, did it. Uh, First, uh, to promote our institutional repositories, and second, uh, to make our thesis more visible. Uh, how we did it? Well, that is a question now. Um, uh, we did it by assigning a DOI uh, to all our theses, and also equipping all records uh, for theses with a lot of useful, uh, useful links. Uh, also, uh, we implement and deposit uh, uh, metadata uh, to uh, various um, open access repos repositories, uh, such as uh, the European Library, DART, Open Door, etc. So, thank you for your attention, and if you uh, have any questions, feel free uh, to ask. Thank you very much. have an actual poster, <laughs> it's in the room. So my name is uh, Mathilde Panès, I work for the Library of Medicine uh, of the University of Lausanne and in Switzerland, and my colleagues and I worked on, a, on the authorship roles in the biomedical field. We created a new model um, that defines 10 roles in the publication process. This role reflects uh, reality um, of the division of labor during the publication process. Um, and is uh, different from the model that is uh, currently used at the Faculty of Medicine. In the second phase of uh, our research, we conducted interviews uh, with researchers uh, to confront our model to the reality, their reality. And the model we created, as well as the results of our uh, interviews, are available on uh, our poster. Please come and see it, because it's not here, obviously. <laughs> and uh, thank you a lot. <laughs> Hi, I'm Marika Willems from the Libre Office, and I wanted to explain you poster number 15 from Europeana Newspapers by giving you the premiere of the Europeana Newspapers animation. The United Kingdom no. is... <laughs> newspapers. I find something unexpected every time I look at one. It's the... Newspapers. I find some. No. <laughs> I need sound. Yeah. Perhaps I can take this time to make some practical announcements. Newspapers. I find something unexpected every time I look at one. It's the diversity. There's a whole world inside their pages. The news, of course, but also cartoons, letters, shipping reports. They're endlessly useful to researchers like myself. Through them I can track the spread of ideas, the evolution of language, the aspirations and achievements of nations. And technology is dramatically changing their value. Not long ago, I'd have to go through fragile paper copies, one issue at a time. Now millions of newspapers are freely available online, like the collection created by Europeana newspapers. It's 10 million historic newspaper pages from across Europe, all searchable on a single website. The possibilities make my head spin. So much content and so valuable. I'm very excited about the trends I might now be able to see, uncovering how new words spread from one country to another, 
or comparing regional opinions to elections or wars. Advertising could tell me about the evolution of consumerism or graphic design. The real digital revolution is that in two million pages, the structure and content is being tagged. I'll be able to distinguish headlines from articles, search for Paris the city instead of Paris from Greek mythology, Biela the river instead of the famous comet. I see it as a liberation of the newspaper. Okay, I have two small announcements to make, but before I do, I'd like to have another round of applause for all of our poster presentations.